I walked you through the blueprints for this project. Okay, so the first um, the first thing we're going to be talking about, guys, is uh, commercial building plans and specifications. Like I said, the project that you have 22 chapters, they're following a two-story building with a basement for multi-disciplines, five occupants, I believe, into this project. So let's talk about the blueprints. You guys will generate the blueprints for the commercial project. Well, this book has a commercial project blueprints that they want you to walk through, so they give you an, another example of how to do things. A couple of things, guys, we, we're hoping to achieve. Yeah. That's my... Uh... I have to get my my highlighter up and running here. Okay, pointer. There I go. So a couple of things I'm gonna I'm hoping we can achieve. We'll talk about the MEC code book and how it's related to to the design. Everything that we design is based on so-called the electrical bible, which is an MEC code book, and how it's related to the electrical um, design project for commercial building. Um, then there's a few things, guys, about adopting the MEC code book in Minnesota. We will be adopting 2014 soon. Um, it's coming, hopefully everything goes okay. July 1st, we'll be adopting. So we'll talk a little bit about the process of adopting the MEC code book, just off of your eye, because this Bible, is you're going to live with it. Safety, safety rules. Every time we start a new project, guys, we always talk about safety. And we do it for the apprenticeship. We do it for, for you guys, the designers. You will not be carrying tools, but you will be around people who are carrying tools at all times, electrical tools and safety for you guys when you become a project manager is as important as for electricians. So we talk about this one. Um, then we talk about the project requirement and the contract documents, all the specification that you do. There's certain things we'll talk about the specification, how they lay out and so forth. Um, Plans and specification, like I said, and part of the so your specification will be part of your contract. So you take your spec that you I gave you guys, your blueprint, and a couple of uh, contract, and that will be uh, the the legal document that you sign between you and the owner when you build that building for them. So we'll talk a little bit about the specification too. Uh, specification information on the buildings. So there's some information related in the spec about the commercial project. We'll be talking about this one. Uh, industry related organizations, if you are to excel in this industry, guys, you have to know NEMA and UL and a bunch of others and IEEE standards. So we'll talk about a few IEEE standards, um, uh, NEMA standards and so forth. And the last thing, guys, is SI system and international system. We always, every chapter we started, if you guys looked at the books that I started, the residential project, we always have something about the SI system, designing system based on the international um, unit system, not the standard system. I always like to do that. Okay, so um, wiring commercial. Every time when it comes to a commercial again, we did this one for the residential. Now we're talking about wiring commercial. Safety in a commercial building becomes a major thing, guys. Now we are, have a higher voltage, higher amps. Higher voltage, higher amps are lethal, lethal. Huge amount of energy that you're controlling, huge amount of energy. So safety becomes a big deal. Uh, number one, we'll talk about this one. Wiring methods are completely different. We no longer can use, good morning, we no longer can use raw mix. We have to use MC or AC cable, or we're going to use an EMT conduit. So we have to be introduced to different wiring methods. Um, electrical equipment are also completely different. We're instead of using 24120, now we use 28120 or 48377, complete three phase. And I'm going to let Todd today, in a few seconds, guys, talk about the difference between. He puts a great presentation, guys, about the difference between load centers and panel boards and switch gears and switch boards. Great presentation. Lumineers are completely also different in a commercial building, and an the code requirement is also different. There is not a whole lot that any secret book can tell you where to put your receptacles in a commercial building. All the stuff, Adam, are going to be coming directly from a specification, engineering specification. Um, Okay, using the text and the set of the plan for specification and we see um, for this, what you are learning for typical commercial project. So the whole idea, guys, is again co co correlating what you are, have learned with a typical commercial project. And for us, we teach this book, guys, for electricians. Electricians don't design a building. Typically, we don't do a design. For you guys, you went the next step. So here's an example how the building is designed for you, and you will be doing another building, right? So... Um, Derek, my friend, is like I said when we went over the blueprints on Friday. We said this is um, this is an example, and another example for you. 
Every time we talk about electricity, it's related to safety. Every time you deal with electricity, there are two major hazards associated with the science of electricity. Hazard number one is the shock hazard. Matt, you're so smart that you don't touch energy as an object and get electrocuted, right? You're smart enough. Most of us are. We learned that when we were kids. Um, now, when you are as a designer, guys, walking in a building around electricians, shock hazard, you do not touch things that could be energized, number one. And if they're working on energy as objects, should, you should not be in the area. You are the public, um, unless you're dressed up as a PPE. And by the way, you are not actually, you are not qualified to be in the work zone for energy as objects. So that's why, you know, the shock hazard and the arc flash are this big ball of fire coming at you if there's an explosion inside your panel. So be aware. That stay away from um, the, the if the electricians are working on this panel and you're the designer there, make sure you keep at least nine to ten feet distance from you and working on this energized object, uh, the panel. If there's an arc flash, arc blast, the electrician should be PPE'd, have the proper gear on them. You are not authorized, licensed, um, uh, or qualified to work on energized objects. So you shouldn't be in the whole area. So be aware of that one. OSHA, Occupational Safety and Health Act has a lot of rules guys about working on energized equipment summary in two without getting to an OSHA training number one is you shall work on things they energize the rule is they energize everything because you before you work on it that's how we build the building number two if you are to work on things energized for two reasons number one because you cannot troubleshoot it energized you have to be energized you have to troubleshoot the system when it's energized right uh, and number two because of safety you're working in a hospital you can't shut down the whole floor and the people are sitting there in the operation room and say, okay, I'm going to change a bulb. So that's why I'm going to shut down the whole uh, um, circuit. So you can't do that. For safety and for um, uh, working on equipment, you can work on it air jobs. OSHA, as well as 70E guys, use the word qualified person. You are not a qualified person to work on air jobs object. Be aware of this. You're not qualified. A qualified person is working on energy as object. You're qualified as a designer. You design the system, you go modify the system, but you're not qualified to carry the screwdriver and open that panel and work on it. For, in Minnesota, you have to be licensed or work under a licensed electrician, number one. And number two, you have to have a knowledge and the skills of the installation and operation uh, related to this equipment as well as the hazard associated with it. So you guys know probably the, how the system works how it's instructed, and also we teach you a little bit about the hazard associated with the work on it. But you're still not authorized to work on it as a designer. You have to be an electrician. When when you go in the field to the to the airport, you're not supposed to carry tools. You cannot. If you carry tools and open one of these panels, your insurance, and you, God forbid, get killed, your insurance, your company's insurance will not carry it, will cover it. So very, very major thing, guys, when it comes, we're designers, we go in the field, we observe what they're doing, we get the information, we correct them, but we're not supposed to carry tools and open panels and work on energized objects or non-energized. I can't go to there, take this outlet and put it back. That's not part of your job. Okay, so that's safety. 70 year courses between 70 and OSHA. They have two standards, like I said. The rule is lock out, tag out procedure, lock every single piece of equipment that you're gonna work on it to work on it energized. And there's a procedures for lock out, tag out. And, and if you cannot because of you can't troubleshoot the system unless it's energized, that's one reason for working on it energized or safety, <clears throat> life, uh, people's life depend on it, like in a hospital, then you can, you have to put your PPE, um, personal protective equipment, rated based on the hazard and work on the energized equipment, remove the public away, there's zones, there are flash zones and so forth that you have to do. For you guys, the only thing you need to know is if you as a project manager, make sure that these rules are followed. Um, so for example, you see Adam opening this panel without his PPE and you're a project manager, you should bring to his attention or to his supervisor attention that that's, that's violation of OSHA um, rules. Okay. When you use portable power tools in the field, the, the key word for this one is GFCI. All the portable uh, equipment, guys, when you're a project manager in the field, you see somebody have a, a power strip that does not have a GFCI, the first thing you need to do is go remove that one. We will get an OSHA citation for this, right? Your project man you're not doing the work, but you are the project manager responsibility. So um, 
We'll talk a little bit guys about arc flash, arc glass, arc flash, arc glass. You are working on this panel and accidentally or typically accidentally you dropped something inside the panel. Now you got your high, a little bit high impedance, they call it high impedance fault and big ball of fire came out of it, melted cover, bullets chasing you, cover. Um, look at the temperature that you can get and uh, that you can get. You can get up to 35,000 uh, degree Fahrenheit ball of fire right in your face so if you're not dressed up for it what's going to happen to your face you lost your face so this is what we used to scare the electricians when they're working on the equipment guys the size of the building that you're going to be doing i believe is five to six hundred amp to eight one twenty the building that you're doing guys right now in the commercial project for the industrial project it will be close to four thousand amp that's as high as you can get you're opening a four thousand amp 480 switch gear this is basically a suicide mission if you're not wearing your your proper ppe and even with your proper ppe that doesn't mean you if you have a arc arc flash inside the switch gear doesn't mean you're going to go home and watch your favorite show that night you will probably spend a couple of months in the hospital but you'll survive most likely you will survive <laughs> you know if you don't have your ppe you know there will be a funeral so that's kind of the difference uh, look what happened too they can melt the cover or aluminum this thing and the steel so imagine that switch gear turn into melted steel melted copper um and with the pressure that comes out of it pushing all these melted copper steel aluminum right through your face or your tummy you can imagine how ugly that blast would be um the hot melted particles um and the hot the gases will be thrown blown right at you that's why we have that ppe to shield you from all this hopefully um and of course um do not underestimate smaller panels just because the system is 28120 don't think that you can survive it lethal when it comes to higher voltage higher amps lethal lower voltage lower amps less lethal but that doesn't mean you can't burn your face so the, the idea guys if it's 120 240 whatever when you open something energized you put your shield you put your proper ppe any comments any questions about the safety i know you are not electricians but you will be a project manager involved in this um when you're working in the field this will be the tools that you're going to be using obviously everything's gfci protected uh, 15 20 and 30 amps 120 and 241 20 in the field have to be gfci um every panel based on any secret book guys have to have a label that warn the people from the arc flash hazard they call it the arc flash hazard and the shock hazard too and it will have a category from zero all the way to four four being the worst arc flash you can encounter if it's higher than four then there are situations when you guys are going to be doing calculation for me you're going to have a category higher than four guess what's going to happen uh, the arc flash cannot be covered up to four if it's more than four then you stop and you don't work on this piece of equipment energize you have to go de-energize it before you work on it too, too dangerous so these are the categories of the ppe that you can use ppe personal protective equipment category zero most of the time just the glasses category four big suit with shield and so forth and you guys will be doing this calculation and based on 110.16 you have to label every single panel with a label like this this is a couple of things guys to to be aware stand to one side you guys are not working on energized equipment but if we are if you go to in the field and i've been in the field with electricians as an engineer you make sure you move away give yourself the rule is give yourself 10 feet away from any switch gear when they start working on it 10 feet away move 10 feet that's a, the the arc there are examples of arcs have killed the 10 feet guys so 10 feet so when this is panel your electricians work on it you're an engineer you're going to observe it when they start opening that panel move away 10 feet that's your safety zone so don't be right stick your head right next to them so that's your uh, and and stand on one side you guys uh don't stand in front of the switch gear. There's there's examples, guys, where people stand in front of the switch gear and, and open it or close it. The whole switch gear or panel or disconnect like this blew up. This will blow up right into their tummy and kill them. So they want you to stand to the right when you open and close this equipment to one side, basically. This one, in this case, I'll be standing right here as I open and close this equipment. This is turning around. Uh, this can have your little camera. Uh, Karen. The, the, the video camera, the small little handy, not the bigger one, 
Well, no, they all should be in that. Yeah, no, it's missing. Okay, ask Steve. I'll check it. Okay. I don't know. No, I don't know. Okay, appreciate it. Thanks. Okay, so that's basically what you're going to be standing to the side. Um, a lot of information, guys, in 70E. It talks about all this. And labeling is coming from ANSI. ANSI have away all these colors, the red and the orange and the yellow. They're coming from an ANSI standard. Red, imminent danger. Um, yellow, danger, but not imminent. It's not going to kill you. And uh, or an orange, um, it's less. And yellow, of course, is just a warning. So they have a labeling, sign labeling a criteria that they use from ANSI. Safety signs and labels. Any comments, any questions, guys, about this? So you have to adhere to 70. So as the only thing this will adhere to you or relate to you guys if you're in the field. How can be? How can you be in the field as a designer? You're in the field to observe uh, your projects. Okay, moving away from the safety. This is just a few things about the safety. Then specification. I always give you guys a set of spec. The set of spec have general clause and conditions. I start with... Um, so you, it has to be, you put it with your plans, it it accompany your plans. Every time you have a set of plans, you have a set of specification with it. This becomes your part of your um, building contract. When you, when you sign a contract to build this building, that's part of your contract. There is something called general clause and conditions. They put it at the beginning on the same project. This first section has the legal requirement that you're going to do legal requirements of the project, describe what you're supposed to do and what you're not supposed to do. Um, again, this becomes part of your legal documents, guys, when you sign this contract, part of your specification. Um, section maybe include, here's a couple of things, notice to the bidders, when the bidders will be open, what date and so forth. The schedules of the drawings is part of it. The proposal that you're going to submit, the agreement, who's going to be signing this agreement, and other general, other general conditions. So that's your um, general clause, what they call it. So notice to the bidders, the bid will be on this date at this location. We're going to be have a bid opening. Um, we're going to have a schedule of the drawings, all the set of drawings. Yeah, you have proposal. I propose to do this work for two million dollars, build your hospital for you. <coughs> Agreement: Who's going to be signing it? And the name and the people who are going to be signing this project. Um, so these are a few things that would be added to your specifications. Any comments, guys? Any questions? The spec that I gave you is typically only electrical only spec. But when we have a project, when we build a hospital, guys, like I told you on Friday, we're only 10% of this hospital. So your electrical spec will be part of a major other spec um, that other contractors will be in, other contractors will be involved in it. There's also something called supplemental general contract uh, specification, more specific. So they add more of it. I will emphasize on this one. Uh, contractor specification. Uh, this is where we become, guys, a separate section of specification for various contractors. This is where we can um, NC uh, or CSI at 26,000 um, is our series. When you see CSI 26,000, that's a series that tells you what type of a switch gear, light, and so forth. For the residential project, guys, I gave you a couple of sets, right? Set of specification. Why do we have specification? Because if you don't tell me what type of a spec for the light, I want to go buy the cheapest type of fixture um, manufactured and put it in your building. So specification guarantee you, especially the contractor specification, will guarantee you um, that you're going to have a quality equipment installed in your building. That's all. Switch gear, panels, and so forth. Any comments, any questions, guys, about the specification? So your your um, contractor specification, or electrical engineering specification, will be a part of all um, the 26. We have a 27. We have a whole set of specification. This is not the time for it, guys. I'll give you CSI specification layout, and every discipline has its own. They, they have these um, numbers. Our number is 26,000, and so we have all these numbers to fill for all the electrical specification. Mechanicals have um, other have another uh, number and so forth. Blueprints, these are the stuff that you guys are designing with me in CAD and Revit. Um, basically shows how are you going to, your equipment are laid out and circuited, right? Isn't that what you guys did with me? Um, why do we need them? Um, in order to get your approval, a lot of, um, 
A lot of agencies guys require them. Local government and agencies review require you blueprint, so called the spe the specification as well as the plans in order for review and approval. A um, couple of places where you can find dictionary of con of construction terms. If when construction terms, you can find it here. If you're going to get into the contracting, it's beyond that class. Um, codes and organizations, guys, cities and power companies can't. The most important code that you have to adhere to is two codes. Uh, there for us, the National Architect Code and Building Code. These are we adhere to them all the time. Then cities and power companies have their own standards and codes that you have to be, be familiar with them. So when you start dealing with Excel, you might have to talk to Excel and say, what's your standards when it comes to the mirror sockets? For example, now the, the you have to have a 200 amp for new construction for residential, right? Yeah, I think after um, 200 amp, after 400 amp, you have to have a meter cabinet. You have to create a meter cabinet. You guys will be making meter cabinet for us, uh, or CP cabinet. Um, the most important code, of course, is the National Grid Code uh, done by NFPA, National Fire Protection Association. And their goal is to protect the public from the fire, promoting science of fire protection and improving fire protection methods to protect our uh, wood. Most of most of our homes are made out of wood, right? Imagine wood and fire goes uh, goes hand in hand. So to protect the, the public from the hazard of fire coming from it. That's their goal. And they published the National Electric Code since 1897, 1897. Okay, a few things about the standards, guys. Right? National Electric Code, you know, it is called the Bible or the Quran or whatever you want to call it um, for electricians. So when you design and build the building, and you don't know any secret book, might as well just go build it in Namibia, you know, or whatever. So um, we build and design the building based on any secret book. If you design a building, uh, Derek, and something happened, and they send and you go to court, guess what? Uh, and they're going to hire an expert. The the, uh, the legal system will hire an content expert. They call them like your friend Chad, registered engineer. I'll go review your stuff. And I'll grab this book and I cite. He did not follow section number uh, 250.30. So if I cite these, that's a lot. So that's how powerful that book is. And I, I then then I can make or break the case against you. So <clears throat> must be. But if you follow this and you still have issues, your chances of winning a case in a court is much higher. Yeah, I, I used all the industry standards and we still have an accident. It becomes an accident. Um, okay, consulting NEC before any installation. Who writes the code? The codes, guys, a couple of things about the codes is coming out of proposal. You can do a proposal and submit it at the end of the code. Uh, so I am, um, for example, I would like to propose to use NM cable in every type of building, type one through type five. Submit it there, a bunch of experts. There's, uh, what is it, 19 committees that divided the code into 19 committees. They look into it and they say, well, this doesn't make sense, throw it. This makes sense, let's consider it. So that's a proposal. Every year they have proposal. Um, and then after they do the proposals, the code making panels, that's a term that they use for it in any sequence book, code making panels. There's, I believe, 19 of them, 19 code making panels. Every section in the code or article have, um, or, or, or content has a group of people uh, on the code making panels. So they submit them, then they have comments to the public. They approve or disapprove the proposals, and they have something called report on proposals. Then they submit the report for the public so they can comment on it. Remember, this is America, a democracy, right? So here, we want to change things. What do you guys think, right? So when people comment on report proposal. After they comment, then they submit another one. So to report on comments, report on comments. So submit another proposal. And then the public have a right to, to look at it. And after they submit this one, they meet and they approve, they vote um, and they approve the NEC code book. So they, they meet, so final action, the proposal and the comments taken at the annual meeting, they vote on it and they approve it. That's how they, they do the NEC code books. Not like Chad sat in his basement and wrote all these rules and regulations. So that's where you, where you find certain things, guys, kind of uh, weird and compromised because it's compromised between so many parties, interest groups, and so forth. Then it's published. 
Quick reminder, 2013, 2014 has been published. He went, every court cycle goes through this uh, report on um, proposals, report on proposal, comments, report on comments, and then uh, approval or, um, um, yeah, the approval process and then publishing. Okay, a couple of things, guys. We, we always start with any sequence book, the arrangement of any sequence book. The first three chapters are the bread at the bottom of any sequence book. It tells you here where does the, the construction of any sequence book, the wire method and protection. All your wire methods they're going to be using are in chapter three. Equipment like motors and transformers and generators are in chapter four. These are special equipment and special conditions and special occupancy. Uh, uh, occupancies. Then we have the communication, telecommunication chapter and all the cables and access associated with it. And you guys are going to spend all your life basically studying this if you are to stick in this field. But be aware that um, these, these chapters made out of probably 80% of what you need when you design is right in the first four chapters. And we dig into it as deep as you want and you're going to spend all your life basically digging and getting more information from these uh, the NEC code book. Any comments, guys? Any questions? Comments, questions? There's something called um, National Tech Code Style Manual that they're writing the style manual. And I think uh, 90.5 will tell you what what does the NEC code book apply to and what it doesn't apply to. For example, mining, electrical utilities like uh, where Brian works, their distribution, transmission, generation plant are not covered by the NEC code book. Why? Because they're very smart and they have their own rules that are more strict than the NEC code book. So other than that, other than mining and automobile and ships and vehicles and cars and airplanes, and, and, and mines or well, utilities like uh, telecommunication utilities, electrical utilities. Other than that, almost everything is covered in any secret book. The, the style manual, guys, it will tell you if there's a definition used in two chapters or more, you must put it in the Article 100, the definitions. Uh, exceptions, issues, uh, site code references. So there's um, every time you have. You know, you want to design something. Why can't I put um, my fuse in a bathroom? Why can't I put a, dis a fuse disconnect in the bathroom? Because the NEC code book says you shall not put an over devices device in the bathroom. Right? Why can't I use barbed wire to wire a building like this? Because the NEC code book does not approve the wild, uh, a barbed wire as a wiring method. As simple as this. Right? Because remember, we're creative. We can do a lot of stuff. Um, lighting fixture. Why can't I design a coffee can and put a, a bulb in it and make it a lighting fixture? It works. Very creative because it has to be UL listed. And the code says that, that a lighting fixture has to be UL listed. Go to UL, get a list for the coffee can with a socket inside it and a bulb and a very decorative issues in it and get them to approve it as a safe uh, uh, lighting fixture. And you got then your secret book will, will allow you to install it in a building. Does that make sense? So that's where it becomes citing the NEC code book and so forth. Approve. A couple of terms you guys have to do. Approve. Approve in the U.S. have to have a power, a jurisdiction power. To approve things, you have to have the jurisdiction. The approvement is typically for the authority having jurisdiction, which is electrical inspector, marshal, fire marshal, building inspector. Those guys, that government, local, local, state, or federal government have given them a power. Right, we the public give the those guys a power, right? Is that we don't we give the, the power to the government and the government put the power give the power to the electrical inspector or the police officer so they can stop you when you're drinking. No, do you know? Shall we pick on that one? <laughs> or when you're uh, speeding and highway 35 dollars. Okay, approved the authority having jurisdiction. The authority having jurisdiction, guys, this is typically a local, state, or federal authority represented in in the person that's an electrical inspector or building inspector, right? Identified, identified as a quote, but identified for certain use. So this piece of equipment is identified for using outside or, or inside by testing laboratory. Labeled and listed, labeled and listed, a third party like UL guys have very smart, competent group of people who list equipment. For example, Adam, that lighting fixture right above your head is listed for indoor use. It cannot be outdoor use in a wet location. Who will do that? UL and other uh, third party verification. Rules, 
There's the rules, guys, in the Nisikud book. If you shall not, it will tell you, shall not be used, shall be used, shall be permitted. If it shall be permitted, it's up to you. Shall not be used, you can't use it. Um, sh um, shall be used, then you can use it. So there's a couple of words that they use. Shall and shall not, and shall be permitted, shall not be permitted. Um, fine print notes, they got rid of them in 2011, and they pulled information notes. Now, this is up by eye, so be aware of this. And most of us guys, when any secret book have an information for you, like what a job is an information note. Most of us in the design industry, we take it immediately. We, we incorporate it. Um, a couple of very important organization guys, when you deal in the electrical industry, one of them is called the Underwriter Laboratory. You guys are familiar with the UL. That's when you look at your fridge or microwave, whatever, you have the UL listed in it. What that means is those guys have a manufacturing floor or they have a floor where they put every single electrical equipment and other equipment and they b basically test them based on the specification of the manufacturer and if they meet the specification they give him a label they list them put them in a list and give him a label and say yep it's safe to be used based on the specification of the manufacturer so it's very very important guys they test and list these equipment um so they have a list for them and they are labeled they label them with you on this means this piece of equipment picture when it's you you are listed and labeled safe to be installed when the inspector walks in guys and see an equipment that doesn't have a listing on it they will ask you to take it down very very important listing and labeling of equipment a lot of counterfeit products guys counterfeit products believe it or not uh, we have opened market in america so you can have uh, counterfeit products does not have you a listing you shall not be used right um so be very careful uh, they call the national record recognized testing laboratories these are third party verification that would tell you that what you're doing is exactly what you what you say your equipment can do is what exactly your equipment will do for example this switch gear can handle uh, 65,000 amps what they do is they take it on uh, in their laboratory, guys, and they inject 60,000 amp, and they watch that switch gear blow up or sit still for a couple of milliseconds. That's how they do it. And if it doesn't blow up into pieces, they'll give it a list. Yep, it's okay. If it blows up, they send it back to the manufacturer and say, keep working on it. Doesn't meet the UL standards. So, do you? If it blows up, huh? Huh? If it blows up. If it blows up, it doesn't meet the uh, qualification. Yeah, when you have a switch gear and you inject 65,000 amps into it, what's going to happen to uh, if it if it handle it for milliseconds? Check doesn't, then it doesn't meet the criteria. Um, wet location, for example, if you have a fixture for wet location. They take that fixture and they basically spray that fixture with water, and then observe what's going to happen. Would the water get in? If it does, fail. If it doesn't for whatever amount of time they, they have, it meets you all standards. So it's major, major things, guys, when it comes to this. Um, so be aware of the counterfeit when you do it. These are for project managers. Um, these recognized, so-called National Recognized Testing Laboratory, guys, there's many of them. There's another one of them that provides safety testing for electrical equipment to ITS. NEMA is the third one. They also provide NEMA 0 through NEMA 9, magnetic starters, and all the enclosures, NEMA 1 and NEMA 3R. These are all the <clears throat> uh, National Electrical Manufacturer Association. When you see a NEMA, these are also recognized equipment that are safe to be installed. So they develop, develop standards that are uh, designed to assist uh, people who purchase in selecting and obtaining correct product for a specific application. ANSI, major things. ANSI actually adopted the National Institute of Food as their, their standards, um, Na American National Standard Institute. Any equipment that have a label on it with ANSI label, uh, not ANSI label, have, um, um, you know, meet ANSI standards, it will be safe to be installed. If you're doing some work in Canada, there's the Canadian Standard Association, which is slightly or significantly, depending on how you look at it, different than any secret book. All these guys, our organization involved in writing standards um, for certain aspects of the electrical industry. IAEI, um, goal is to improve understanding of NEC code book. Those guys, they dedicated their life into the NEC code book. They have, every time there's an NEC code book, 
a new there, publish what's the changes and so forth. Um, I want you guys to pay a little bit of attention because we're designers to this baby here. Illumination Engineering Society of North America, IESNA. Next week, you guys with your friend Chad, you will be using the IES files. We call them IES files when we do lighting calculation. This is the Bible when it comes to lighting calculation. Can I get you, your attention, guys, in this particular one? Because we will be using it. We will, we're going to call a file, IES file. When I ask you, go get the IES file for this picture. So get used to IES. IES, Illumination Engineering Society, and NA is North America. Uh, they have handbooks for lighting guys, which set the standards for the illumination industry. It sets the standards, literally, for illumination industry. Every uh, illumination software or lighting software that you buy, it will be following these standards. Any comments, guys? Any questions about that? Comments, questions, especially this um, IES, NA, very, very important. Again, all these guys, National Electrical Installation Standards, these are cool. How do you bend the rigid conduit? What are the best practices in bending rigid conduit or PVC or EMP? They have tons and tons of standards. You guys, Karen and um, Adam, when you went with Steve, when you were bending conduits and Karen, I don't know if you've seen some of these standards that we have in the library there. It tells you how to bend the conduit. Uh, what's the best uh, method of installing an MC cable, AC cable, best practices, they call them. So, very, very important. Has tons of them. And the last one is your friend Chad. Chad Kearney here. If all hell break loose, you pay me $1,000 and I can approve uh, an equipment for you. Not me. Any, uh, they call them registered professional engineer. Every state, guys, have registration for the engineers and have a list of engineers who can actually approve equipment. So, Derek, if you have a piece of equipment coming from Germany and doesn't have your listing on it and you need to install it for the airport, for example, because it's the only piece of equipment that works there, right? So, what are you going to do? There is a list of engineers on the Department of Labor and Industry, literally list of registered engineers in Minnesota, approved. I'm not one of them, but you can submit. You have to be an engineer to be registered with the state of Minnesota as an engineer, which is as high as you can get, and then, um, then you can approve equipment. What they, what they typically do is they'll send you back to the factory, you go to Germany, watch what they're doing, write the report, sign it with your name and license, and say, yep, this is this is safe equipment to be installed. So anyone at Mashad Kool Yerkson, I don't know if any of those registered engineers there, um, they, but they have also have to be registered with the state, yeah. which is you have to go through the, the process. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think they do OK. Absolutely. So these are another um, another very important. So all these organization guys will help you design a safe equipment. Abandoned cables. This is just a couple of things. When you have an abandoned cable, you're supposed to remove these abandoned cables because they not. Yes, they are not going to start the fire, but but they will be the fuel for the fire. So that the code talks about removing all these cables, um, and even the electrical specification. If you read through them, guys, it tells you remove these cables. Last thing, guys, is um, the SI system. We've been talking about the SI system. A lot of manufacturers have, we have two systems. We have the international system and the standard system. Uh, 2011, of course, we're 2011 here. If you look at the NEC code book, guys, 2011 and 14, and all of them now, they show two units. It's annoying, isn't it? When you Because it makes the code big. Um, but it shows two units right next to it. Metric system, as well as the standard system. A lot of us guys, I don't know, have you guys used, when you work at Mashat Kuli, did you use a, a metric system? I know at LRB Beckett, we use some metric system because we did work overseas in, in the Middle East as well as in South America. Um, in Canada, they use a metric system. So it's a closer the, closer to you than you, what you think. So if you are to use a metric system, any code is made to be used with the metric system or the standard. So be aware of that. There's something called the soft and hard metric conversion. Depending on how do you design um, the equipment to the metric standards, or do you design it to the uh, to the uh, standard, the uh, to the, either the metric or the standard, or you convert them? So here's a couple of things, guys, in terms of uh, customers and metric uh, comparing inches to units and so forth. You guys read them on your own. There's something called trade sizes. Trade sizes are completely different, guys, than the actual sizes. We talked about this one. So when you say half an inch, 
E M T is not the in the in uh, the interior diameter of half an inch EMT is different than the interior diameter and the exterior diameter of a half an inch rigid. Okay, so that's the trade sizes. <clears throat> Uh, we have metric designator for them, uh, guide to metric usage, and this is just a couple of things about the metric usage. We talked about this one, it's all based on 10, right? Either you divide by 10 or multiply by 10, base of 10. And guide usage for metric. In the metric, guys, they use prefixes, and we all use it, guys, megawatt, kilowatt, uh, unit, um, microfarad, we use microfarad, nanofarad, so these are you know mega mega is what a million k is a key, uh, a thousand micro is one over um is a micro one over thousands no one over um a million is a micro a milli is one over a thousand and nano is one over ten to the power nine i believe okay so there's a, a couple of things here's a couple of examples be aware of this one guys when it comes to the conduit fill this might help you um Karen, understand the conduit fill. Look at this. I have half an inch of different type of conduits, and uh, inside the amateur of each one of them is completely different. So this is 0 0.6 for the EMT, 0 0.5, 0 0.63, 0 0.632, and 0.66. So the rigid, the rigid is actually the largest. Can you guys see that? All of them are called half an inch um, conduits, but the interior diameter is completely different. As well as the exterior damage. So be aware of the trade, the trade uh, size versus the actual size. Trade size versus actual size. That will help you, Brian, when you're doing conduit fill. Why does half an inch rigid have more or less uh, conductors than half an inch EMT? Because they're both half an inch, just a name. The actual diameter is different. Does that make sense? When, if anybody ever wondered why half an inch in this conduit can carry more than half an inch in the other conduit or less? Isn't there a, isn't there a place in the AC where they control the... Oh, shit. Is that the word? <laughs> Sorry, it's just the... Like, yeah, inside... I don't know if it's an NEC code book, though. Um, NEC? I'm not sure. I don't think that this is an NEC. This is industry standard. Um, a couple of conversion guys between them. I gave you when we started this project that conversion little software. Everybody still have it? I don't know. It's on the network too. You can convert convert from any unit to any unit. So um, my favorite is always a meter to a, a foot or a foot to a meter. Meter is 3.2, 3.3 feet. So 3.3 feet is one meter. That's kind of a, in the back of my mind. Okay, so that's basically it, guys, in terms of um, conductors. Let me see if we have a couple of pictures before I let you get ready for my friend. Okay. All right, so the, the rest, guys, is um, this talks about the different type of construction. Please, these, all these pictures are coming directly from your book. So why is it so important to know if, if this symbol is for brick, guys? Because it will um, allow you to use certain wiring methods and not others. So these are all the um, different type of construction material that we use. Look at the installation, how they show it on the project. So they're showing different type of, um, uh, for other disciplines. Let me go back. Okay, here you go. So another another one, all these for the architecture, look at the elevation, they show all the windows and blah, blah, blah. Read them on your own, opening, how they show um, in a plan view, opening for windows and doors and on what's not. The third one is for mechanical equipment, um, the, um, damper, deflector. So you're not supposed to know all this, guys. This is the all the discipline. If you see this, this is damper, uh, automatic, for mechanical equipment, this is damper deflector down. What does it mean and what does it do? You know, it, it's these are mechanical duct incline drop. So just be aware that there these are all the terminology that they use for the mechanical equipment, right? As you coordinate with them. Again, there's so much, guys. There's so many disciplines. That's why we have a team. We have a team of engineers and architects to work on a project. 
But if you, if you look at something and you don't understand it, you're confused, is it electrical or mechanical? Go to the mechanical drawings and check that thing based on their um, symbol list. Talked about this. Arc flash, arc blast. This is just talks about the sound, guys, and the power and, and so what's not that get involved in. Okay, we talked about this one. Guide information for electrical equipment. The white book. Here's another one for you. If you if somebody say, well, this equipment is listed in UL, and you want to go check if it's UL listed or not, where do you guys go? There's something called the white book. White book 2013. I think it's out. Now, you can go check any piece of equipment and see if it's actually listed in UL or not. So that's easy. The book is online. If you guys go to UL, you should be able to download the PDF of it and check any piece of equipment if it's UL listed or not. If it's not UL listed, then it has it's not approved unless it's listed by others too. Here's the label that you're going to get if the equipment is listed, different labels. Um, PB standards for uh, labeling of if there's different standards for labeling here, talked about these. Uh, okay, then you see listing and not, what's not. Okay, these are just the dimension, the actual dimension versus the uh, trade names. And that's about it in this project. Any comments, guys, any questions, do me a favor, read this chapter, guys, there's a lot of information that you can get. You read it one time, do the, do the uh, questions for it. And then, um, then that's basically it. So, so summarize, guys, three things I want to I want to emphasize. Number one is when you're in the field as a project manager, pay attention to safety, safety, your safety, and safety of the others based on OSHA and 70E, right? Number two, <clears throat> um, pay a lot of attention, guys, to the plans and specification when you design a building and all the standards that goes that goes to it. So this lens and specification. And number three is all the standards that have from um, NECA, um, from uh, NEMA standards into UL standards and into ANSI standards, as well as NEC code book. Any comments, guys, any questions? Any comments, any questions? I always summarize it like this, guys. In order to have the best building that you design, you have to start with safe equipment. That's where UL comes. This piece of equipment is safe. They approve it, right? List it and label it. Then you have to install it, design it safely and install it safely. That's where the NEC code book comes. And then you have to maintain it safely. And that's where maintain it and work on it safely. And that's where the 70E and 70B uh, comes. Working, maintaining electrical equipment and working on electrical equipment safely. 70E and maintaining equipment 70B. Any comments, any questions? Comments, questions? Okay, that's all we have for you.